Good morning. morning. It is good to see you here this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. As I was uh, talking with Pastor Harry on Thursday night, Thursday afternoon, uh, he asked me to preach on Thursday, and I said, I'll be glad to do that. He said, uh, I said to him, he says, I said, you preached on marriage, and then you leave town. I said, and you want me to mop up afterwards, huh? And he said, don't tell those people that. And I said, oh, I won't. And I didn't. I just told you the story. So that's... Pastor Harry preached last week on marriage. Uh, Many of you were here and heard that. Uh, I went to both worship services last week because I felt probably I needed to hear it twice. Um, He preached about uh, submitting to one another. And then he preached about wives respecting your husbands. And then he preached about husbands loving your wives. And then he pointed out that the, the big problem, the big sin that takes place in family relationships is selfishness. And that happens in so many of our relationships, especially in marriage. Well, today, today I would like to talk to you about what do you do when you aren't who you're supposed to be? in relationships. What do you do when you don't do what you should do in those relationships? And my scripture this morning is taken from the Sermon on the Mount. And this sermon is by Jesus about living correctly as children of God. In in Matthew 5, 20, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I am sure when he said those words, the multitudes and the disciples who were sitting there, they said, if the Pharisees and the Sadducees who follow the law so diligently can't get into the kingdom of heaven, how in the world are we going to be able to do that? But the thing is that Jesus is setting a new standard. He's going about just observing the law, doing the law, following the law, He's saying, we as children of God, as as citizens of the kingdom of God, we have to approach life in a different way. And then he goes on to explain. You have heard it said to the people long ago, do not commit murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of fire of hell. Therefore, If you have an offering gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother and sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your gift. You probably won't believe this. 
but when I, I, I was a child one time, a little bitty tyke. And I was born and raised in the U.S. In the U.S., we have a saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Have you ever heard that? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Do Chinese have any sayings like that that say, what you say to me is just going to roll off of me and I'm not going to pay any attention to that? We used to say that all the time. Uh, I, was a, a, I was a little, I was a pretty good athlete when I was little. I could run fast, and I could play ball, I could do all kinds of things. And I was really pretty good. I was, you know, when we chose sides, I was always one of the first ones who chose, or are, or, or, I was the team captain, you know. And I was good. And, and, the, and the problem is, I knew I was good, you know. I'm good. And so, when I started strutting too much, they had a saying. Fill the pill who boogied down the hill. <laughs> saying I could run fast, but I was a pill. A pill is bad medicine. I didn't like that. It hurt my feelings. Sticks and stones may break my bones. Well, words can hurt too. Words do matter. Whatever the saying, words do matter. The words we use are important, and we cannot take them back once they're out. Now I have another confession. It's confession time for Phil. <laughs> Sometimes I get angry. I know you don't believe that, Leela. Sweet, kind, compassionate, kind, understanding Pastor Phil. Yes, I get angry. And if you don't believe me, you can just ask my wife or my daughter, and they will tell you that Phil, yes, gets angry. I have a problem with my anger sometimes. I've gotten better over the years, and I hope I will continue to get better. But sometimes I open my mouth, and I say something I shouldn't say. I have a tendency to be just a little bit sarcastic or unkind. And so I try to remember the words in James 1, 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce righteousness that God desires. Now, I am slow to speak, but sometimes I'm not as slow to anger as I need to be. And sometimes my speech when I'm angry is inappropriate. What does Jesus say about that? We should not get angry. But when we do, Jesus says, anyone who says, Raka, that's Aramaic, and it means empty or without substance, not important. It's, it's kind of like we would call somebody, well, stupid. It's not a very good way. Or fool. If you call him a fool, you're a scoundrel is what you are. 
You're not loved. The problem with, with these words are, is not living up to the standards that Jesus, as a child of God, has set for us. That are not treating other people as human beings, but as objects, not people of worth. And Jesus says, therefore, what does he say, therefore? He says, well, in our present Bible study, uh, we're studying in the Old Testament, we're studying the book of Amos. For the last past three Sundays, we studied the book of Amos. And Amos says that the Israelites, when they went to offer sacrifices, they were not acceptable to God because their heart wasn't right. Their heart wasn't right. And that's what, exactly what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, when you're mistreating other human beings, then your heart is not right. And we cannot be right with God when our heart is not right and when we are not right with one another. We cannot hope for forgiveness from God until we have confessed our sins, not only to God, but to those people we have hurt. We must do our best to reconcile, to remove the practical consequences of our behavior. You know, sometimes we wonder why our prayers aren't being answered, or sometimes we wonder why we don't feel good about the worship service we've just been in, and it's, and it's because there's something in us about our relationships with others that is preventing. We know we're not in re- right relationship with uh, others. God knows we're not in re- right relationship with others, and that prevents us from being in right relationship with God. It's a barrier that we cannot cross. Deep down, we know that we are wrong, and that God knows we are wrong, and it affects our relationship with Him. So Jesus says, first go. Immediately, without waiting. It is our responsibility to start the process of restoring relationships when someone else has something against us. Ron Ellis, who is a pastor in the United States, tells a long story, and I'm going to tell you that story this morning. It's about a a lawyer by the name of Dennis. Well, Dennis had the privilege of growing up in in a Christian home. His father was an outstanding Christian and a compassionate attorney. Dennis was supported by his father's prayers and his finances and got... His father got him through law school. And after he went through law school, he graduated. After he graduated, he came to work in the same law firm that his dad had. And Dennis thought his dad was just too much of a soft touch because when people came into the law firm and they needed help, he would give them money. And And he was angry. He said... Father, I, I don't understand this. You're, you're just giving, giving our money away. And his father said to him, Son, there's so much joy in giving. And he picked up his well-worn Bible and he read, It is more blessed to give than to receive. He also read, Inasmuch as, I, as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. But Dennis Dennis remained unconvinced. He thought that other people were taking advantage of his father. After the years went by, his father retired. Dennis took over the law firm. And he did it just like his father did, except for the handouts to those people who needed help. Then one day, Dennis was auditing the books. 
because he had to figure out how much payroll tax he needed to pay for his employees. And he was shocked to find out that the, the, one of the lawyers by the name of Max, who had been keeping the books for his dad for 20 years, had been padding his own personal account. And he had stolen lots of money, thousands of dollars. Dennis was extremely angry. Here was a man whom his father had helped, brought into the law firm, and he was stealing from his dad and from the law firm. Dennis confronted Max with his crime and he banished him from the law firm forever. But Dennis could not forget the crime Max committed. Deep resentment continued to grow in his heart toward Max. It wasn't too long after that that his father became extremely ill and he was dying. Dennis went to the side of his father, and his father encouraged him to give his heart to Jesus because he had never done that. Of all of the family, Dennis is the one who had never accepted Jesus as his Savior and Lord. Dennis saw his father and what a good man he was, and he decided, yes, he needed to be a Christian, and so he accepted it. And his life was transformed. He started reading his father's Bible. And then he started showing love to those people he worked with. And, and the years passed. And, and Dennis was maturing as a Christian. And then one night he was praying and he said, Dear Lord, I'm sorry for this resentment I have toward Max. And the Lord seemed to speak in his in his head, he said, I want you to go to Max and personally ask him to forgive you for the hatred you have felt toward him all these years. And Dennis thought, why should I do that? Max is the guilty one. but it would not go away. Finally, Dennis surrendered himself to the Lord and said, I'll go. And he tried twice. And both times he chickened out. He couldn't, he couldn't go. But then on the third time, he finally made it to Max's law firm and he knocked on the door. And the door opened and there was Max. And Max said, Dennis, what are you doing here? And he backed up. And Dennis said to him, God has placed his love in my heart for you, Max. And I've come here today to forgive, to ask you to forgive me for the hatred that I've felt for you all these years. Max's face turned red. Tears started coming down his eyes. No, Dennis. I'm the one who needs to be forgiven. And Dennis said, no. My hatred needs to be forgiven. In that moment of mutual forgiveness, healing, and hatred disappeared. Dennis and Max experienced the blessing of God's healing love. But wait a minute, Pastor Phil. Wait a minute. Dennis was right. And Max was wrong. Max had stolen money. Dennis should have been angry at him. 
why should Dennis be the one to go see Max? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't Max go see Dennis? Well, you're right. These are the facts of the story. And that's exactly the way you and I look at it, isn't it? But let's look at the scripture. And there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. It does not say if you did something wrong to your brother and sister. It says if your brother and sister has something against you. It does not say who did wrong. Jesus does not place blame here. Jesus is saying if the relationship between you and your brother and sister is broken, it is your responsibility to heal that relationship. You see, as children of God, we should do as it says in Ephesians 5.1. Follow God's example. Today, in our adult Bible study, our study is going to be about Hosea, an Old Testament prophet. God told Hosea to go and marry a woman that God knew was going to be unfaithful to him. And he tells Hosea, when she is unfaithful to you, go and bring her back into your home again. You go and repair the relationship. Because I want to see the people of Israel to realize that this is a symbol of the way that I love them. The Israelites are away from me, and I am asking them to come and be with me and be in relationship with me. That's who God is. You see, God is the one who always takes the initiative, and we are to follow God's example. We are to be like Him. We are to be the one who initiates the restoring of relationships, whether we are right or whether we are wrong. Because we are the children of God, and we follow our Father's example. That's all well and good, right? I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. That's what Jesus did. He came to us. What happens if they don't respond? What happens if you go to somebody and you say to them, Oh, I hurt your feelings. I was very unkind to you. I said some really bad words to you, and I'm really sorry. Would you please forgive me? And they say, No. I don't want you. I don't like you. And I'm not going to have a relationship with you anyhow. That ever happened to you? It's happened to me. What if you go to somebody and you were right? You were the person who was being good. And you go to that person and you say, but I still want to have a relationship with you. 
I don't want to have any difficulty with you. It's okay. Everything's all right between us. I'm not going to be angry. Please forgive me for getting angry. And they say, I don't care. I didn't like you, and that's why I said it. I don't want to have a relationship with you. What do you do? What does God do? Have you ever told God no? Don't we always, often, tell God no? I don't want to have a relationship. You're asking too much. I don't want to do that. But God never stops. If we're to be the children of God and follow God's example and be citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the way Jesus says, we've got new standards to live by. You see, when Jesus comes into our lives and he becomes our Lord and Savior, he is not just saving us from death to new life eternally in heaven. He has given us victory. He's given us victory over the evil of the world, and he's even given us victory over the evil that is inside of us. We must turn our hearts over to him. And when we do, we, like Dennis, become different people. And we hold ourselves to different standards. This morning in this sanctuary, who are you in charge of? At 9.30, my wife was down here, and I said, I would like to be in charge of her. I'd like her to do everything I want her to do. But I'm not in charge of Irene. The only person that I am in charge of is Phil. The only person that I can make do what they ought to do is me. And that's the same with you. We are in charge of no one but ourselves. We cannot control the people we relate to. We can only control how we relate to them. As children of God, we need to be respectful. We need to be loving. We need to be selfless. And second, when we're not, and we're often not, we, you and me, we are the ones who are responsible for the restoration of relationships. Not the other person. We. Let's pray together. Father God, when we read the words of Jesus and realize the new standard that he requires. It's hard. It's hard because our hearts are so hard. We want things to be done our way. We want to be in control. But as children of God, you want us to love. 
You want us to be forgiving and compassionate. You want us to follow your example and be like you and like your son Jesus. Our prayer here this morning is that you will give us strength that we might be who you would like for us to be. Amen.